It's a blessing to be together. Uh, I know we have difficult times in life, but it's so nice to just come and assemble and walk amongst each other and shake hands and say hi to new faces, to see old ones, to give hugs. It's really encouraging to be with God's family. And I hope you feel that way this morning. I hope you feel that way about each other. Uh, if you're with us and, and you, you're new here, or if you maybe haven't been here for some of our previous lessons in this series, we've been doing a sermon series out of Acts chapter 2 entitled, This Is Us. And we've been looking at who we are as the Choctaw Church of Christ. What are we all about? What are we trying to be all about? What, what is it that God wants us to be all about? In our first week, we just discussed how we're only a people because of Jesus. Because of the fact that we have learned that we're guilty of his death and we're witnesses to his resurrection, we've responded to his gospel call and we've be, we have become something greater, something bigger. We've become one and we're not, now we're part of his kingdom. And the last time we were together, we talked about really getting into what we're all about. And first we said, we are devoted. We are an all-in people. Remember, we push the chips to the middle. We go all in with Jesus where he leads us, we'll follow. And we discussed how first we're all in on the apostles' teaching. We're all about the word of God, trying to look at truth and follow it to wherever it takes us and how a healthy church really is like that. But this morning, as we continue in this series, I wanted us to understand this about who we are. We are family. I know the word church is biblical, but I didn't think that really fit the picture that I want us all to have. We're not a place we go to. We're not a people who are acquaintances. No, we're called to be a family. We say things a lot, and I wonder if we really mean them. Like, this is my church family. Are we really family? We call each other things like brother and sister. Do we mean that, or do I only call you brother because I've forgotten your name? <laughs> I might have just spilled the secret there, but uh, some of you are going, you've called me brother for four months. I'm sorry. Um, I need to learn your name. But we call each other brother and sister, and we say we're family, and we sing songs. You know how we gather here. We are now a family. Do we mean that? And what does that mean exactly? If you have your Bible, I want you to open up to Acts chapter 2. I know we've been in the same passage over and over again, but we're trying to pull different things about us as a people and examine them a little further. And this morning, when it comes to us being a family, from this text, I want to highlight two, two points for us to understand. And the first one is, is this. When it comes to Jesus and our calling, Jesus calls us into community. When, it, when we get to Acts chapter 2, uh, we see this sermon that the apostles preach on the day of Pentecost, the first gospel sermon, and how really what they're doing is they're calling these Jews to be restored to Jesus or to uh, leave this darkness, leave sin, and, and become a part of Jesus himself, to become right with God. And we often look at these verses, starting in verse 37, we, we see their response and we highlight it. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And here's verse 38 that was referenced to us a little bit ago and we reference often. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And you have the verses after that, verse uh, 39 and 40. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. I want you to notice this verse. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. This point, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I want to talk about our calling for a moment. We often emphasize how Jesus is calling people out of the lost world into his kingdom of light, out of darkness into light, calling them out of sin to walk in truth, to walk according to his ways. And we typically look at how that response is given. You know, we focus on the why we need to answer, right? That's sin. We got to answer his call because of sin and what it's done to us. And, and we focus on how you answer, and rightly so. We need to repent and be immersed and put our faith in him. And we speak on the result 
of salvation, right? We have forgiveness. We have salvation. We have the Spirit. And those are great. But please don't stop there when it comes to God's calling. Because if we obey the gospel and we focus on what we receive and how great that is and, and how we do it, and then we stop, we fail to see God's great blessing of the church. God has called us into community. Look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I, I wasn't bad at math growing up. I wasn't good at math. If, if any of you are there with me, it just kind of, it is what it is. Have you ever said that phrase? That's how I felt about math. But when you add things together, what you're doing is you're taking individual parts and you're making them one total, one sum. They are now one greater thing. And when it says there, they're added, and this is a reference to God's kingdom, the church on earth. He takes these individuals and when they obey the gospel, not only are they saved, but then they're now taken from that darkness and they're added to his kingdom to become a part of his body. But don't miss this idea that they're added to something greater. And they're added to something that is united. God is calling people out of the world, but he's calling them also into community. If we stop at salvation, we've, we stop short. He's called us to obey the gospel, yes, but that's not it. He's called us to repent and be baptized, that's not it. He's called us to have a relationship with him, but that's not it. He's called us to have a relationship with one another too. I'm afraid that some people treat their faith like a home. Here's what I mean by that. We build our houses. We lock all the doors and windows. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, by the way. I, I get that. If you live next to me, you might lock your door too. I don't know. We, we build fences. And we put signs on our houses and fences and walls that say, no soliciting, no trespassing, uh, loud do dogs present, uh, all, whatever we can do to say basically, this is me, this is my private area, stay out. This is reserved for me and my family. And I'm afraid spiritually some people live like that. That my relationship with Jesus or my faith, my religion, is me and it's Jesus or it's my family and it's Jesus and it's nobody else's. Don't get involved in my life. Stay away. We socially distance 24-7 when it's spiritually speaking. And I'm afraid some people do that, and that's not what God had, has called us to do. Have you ever heard these phrases about people emphasize my personal relationship when it comes to Jesus? Have you heard that? Or maybe this relationship that's becoming ever more popular with people in my generation and age and younger. They say relationship over religion. Have you heard this? I see it all the time with people my age. And and there is some truth to some things about our faith should not be about just doing the same actions over and over again. It's not just about the things we practice, although, although that's important. But it should, there should also be a relationship there. It shouldn't be a religion about we just come together and do some things on Sunday and that's it. No, it's a relationship with Jesus. But what often I think people are somewhat saying in these phrases is, I really don't need anybody else but Jesus. That sounds weird to say, doesn't it? Or I don't need the church. I don't need religion. I don't need these practices or these people. I really just need me and Jesus. Now understand for salvation, you know what I only need? Jesus. But when it comes to living a Christian life, you know what I also need? The church. I need it. We need it. And we, we say these phrases like that, and I think the idea of what we're saying is, we can do this alone. And listen to me. If we live the Christian life alone, we have misunderstood the gospel call. I'll say that one more time. If we purposely are living the Christian life alone, privatizing our own religion, we have misunderstood the gospel and what God has beautifully created through the death of Jesus. God made this church for His glory, and He gave us one another for His and our own benefit. He has called us into community. Do we emphasize that? You ever thought about that? Yeah, he's calling me out of the world. He's calling me out of sin. But he's also calling me to be a part of something greater and to be involved in it. And I'm afraid today in our society, we, we start treating our faith and our spirituality like I'm going to go buy my plot of land and I'm going to build my religion or my spiritual practices and I'm going to do it all alone. 
or my family, we're going to do it all alone. I hope we don't set up our spiritual lives like the lone man on the island or the lone tribe on the island. Because if that's the case, we really haven't understood that Jesus calls us into community. Why would he do that? Why would he call us into community? There's a lot of possible reasons, right? Doesn't it glorify God greater to see people from all walks of life doing the Christian life together? It glorifies God to see people from various backgrounds and who've done various things and who look different, but yet who are unified. That's one possible reason. Another possible reason that I really want to share with you this morning is because we need it. We need community, whether we realize it or not. We're weird people. <laughs> Aren't we? You ever just thought about yourself and say, I'm weird sometimes. I, I want community. I want relationships. I want to interact with people. I want that. At the same time, sometimes all I want to do is be home alone. Is anyone else there with me? Maybe some introverted people. It's like, I want people in my life. I want relationships, but I also just want to lay in bed or on the couch all day and not talk to any soul. I know I need community. I need a church family. I need people to be involved in my life. But yet so often I try to do everything on my own. I try to walk with Jesus on my own. I try to do all of this by myself. And when we do that, we're not understanding the church and the gospel. The church is meant to be a community that helps shape each other more into the image of Jesus. We study together to shape our knowledge of him and we help each other out in the process. We worship together and by doing that we shape our attitudes and our hearts. We work together and we shape ourselves into servants for Jesus who are kingdom minded people. We grow in holiness together through accountability, through confession, uh, through correction at times and through forgiveness. We need one another because without each other we're incomplete. We're immature. Without each other, we can't really live this life to the fullest extent. And we can't be everything God wants us to be. First, this morning, I just want you to understand Jesus calls us to be a community. And not just a community, but to be a family. Now, I'm, I guess I live in the community of more. Hopefully, soon that will be the community of Choctaw. And I can say I'm a part of that community, but that doesn't mean I'm close with everybody or that I know all of them, or that I even want to be. I just happen to live there. I hope we don't think of the church as just, it's just this place I go. It's just these people I see a couple times. No, we're meant to be more than just acquaintances. We're meant to be family. I want you to look at Acts chapter 2 that Owen read, verses 42 through 47. I won't read it again for time's sake, but as you look through there, and if you look through there with the lens of family, do you see all the things they're doing together that are family? They learn together. Verse 42. Families do that. Families take the time. You sit down at the table and you do that math homework with your kid and you hate it. You learn together. They ate the Lord's Supper together. They gathered together as Christians and they remembered Jesus like we have done today. They remembered him. They broke bread together. They prayed together. That intimate act of let's get together and let's pray. Let's talk to our Father. Let's give Him requests. Let's pray that He shapes us and molds us. They witnessed God's work together. They were together in a way where they got to see the great things God was doing among them and in the people around them. They were together physically. For a lot of this, they were physically together, involved in each other's life. They had all things in common. They didn't see everything as this is just mine, but they saw it as something we share. They sacrificed for each other. They were willing to sell possessions and give to those in need and to help one another out. They were together, once again, often. They ate together. They shared meals in each other's homes. I'm sure it was Mexican food. <laughs> they praised God together. They impacted others together. I'm saying that word a lot. But it's because that's what a family is and does. They are together. I know some of what they did in that passage is because of their unique situation. You have Jews from under every nation in heaven who have gathered together for this pilgrimage. Many of these men and many of these people have left homes and businesses and works. And so they're now in this middle of Jerusalem and they need support. So I get there's some uniqueness to it. But understand, they weren't living like a family because of their unique situation. They were living like a family because they were one. We're family. 
Is it my family or my church family? I, I know there's a difference, right? We don't share the same blood. Oh, wait. I know we don't share the same parents. Oh, wait. We have the same father. I, I know we don't have the same background or story. But if you remember our first lesson on this series, we actually do have the same story. We're all sinners in need of a Savior who's given his life for us. I, I'm being a little sarcastic there. I get there's a difference between my brother that was birthed from the same mother and my brother in Jesus Christ. But understand, when they called each other brother and sister in the New Testament, when they called each other family, they absolutely meant it. They didn't qualify it like it was a lesser version of family. That it meant less. You know, well, this is my family. Well, that's just my church family. They are just as much family as my real family. We are family. And because of that, I, I wanted to go over a few questions. You know, when it comes to just being family, Jesus, by the way, did mention something to this extent. In Matthew chapter 12, in verse 46, it said, While Jesus was still speaking to people, behold, his mothers and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Like, hey, hey, we need to talk to Jesus. We're we're his mom. We're We're his brothers. And Jesus said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Do we have that same attitude toward our brothers and sisters in here? That's family. There's so many times, you know, I've had people visit since I've started at Choctaw, and these visitors walk in, and some of you go, who's that? And you know what I say? That's family. When we see each other in the community and someone says, who's that? You go, well, we go to church together. Or is it, that's family. That's a brother, and that's a sister. And if God has called us to live in community and to live as a family, here's a few questions. I think every single one of us need to pause and put our Bible down and read these questions and see how they apply in our own life. How often do we spend time with Christians outside these walls? If the only amount of time that we spend together is on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night assembly, we're missing out. If you spend a Sunday here, a Sunday morning, you're here for what? Two, maybe two and a half hours if I talk a long time. But for 80% or 90% of that time, you're listening and you're really not getting to meet anybody and develop relationships. How often do we spend time with Christians outside these walls? How often are we eating together? In homes or just meeting at a restaurant? How often are we going to each other's kids' ball games to support? How often are we calling each other or messaging each other? How often are we getting together just to talk about life and the struggles we're going through? How often are we spending time with Christians outside these walls? How many people in the church know you deeply? I don't expect people to know you the way your spouse does. Understand that. But how many Christians know you deeply? I mean, more than your name and your family. And I already struggle with that, as you know. But your story, how you came to Jesus. How many people know your temptations? Did that thought just scare you? How many people know what you struggle with? How many people know what's going on in your life behind closed doors? How many know you deeply? It might not be that I'm not trying to get to know people. It might be that I am cut made walls to where no one can really get to know me or there's not enough time in my life to develop those relationships what parts of your life or my life are christians involved in i let them in this part and this part but then this half that's not for them work life family life nope it's not them if i'm a christian isn't god reigning over all of my life isn't jesus involved in all my life Do we segment our lives out to where we don't let people in? Are there any Christians you'd feel comfortable enough practicing confession or prayer with here? Can you imagine going up to someone this morning and saying, Hey, I really struggle with alcohol and I'm tempted to drink it every day of my life. And I gave in yesterday. Can you imagine yourself going up to someone saying, Hey, I... I'm having a hard time not looking at pornography. Can you imagine going up to a Christian here this week and saying, 
I get so angry at my kids and I just raise my voice and I need help. If we don't feel comfortable enough saying any of our sins to anybody here, it's probably because we don't have good enough relationships with people. I know we're apprehensive to share and there's a fear there, but we're also family. Shouldn't family know these things? Last question. Do I enjoy being with my church family? Do you enjoy being with your church family? Sometimes we walk in, walk in here to meet and we look like sad people. <laughs> That's my church family. <laughs> hey, you ought to come. You ought to come on Sunday morning. It'll, <laughs> it'll be great. I'm going to talk to four people. I'm going to frown the whole. Do we enjoy our church family? I, I tell you, in the four months I've been here, I know sometimes we have bad attitudes and we go through things in our life, but man, this church family is a blessing. It's wonderful to be a part of a group of people who care. I, I had to print something off yesterday. I, I walk in the building. There's eight to ten people who are serving a funeral dinner, whether they know that lady closely or not, whether they know our sister Verna closely or not, because they also know Peggy has a situation. And so they, that's my family. I'm going to step up and do that. And then I went to Barnes, who is my family, even though I don't know half of them. And I went to preach, and there's three or four or five or six of my family from here who are going to support even though many of them already heard my lesson, and they stayed for the others. And I walk in this morning, and there's, hey, are you a visitor? Here's bread. And hey, let's shake hands. Let's hug. How are you doing? How's you? We're family. Do we enjoy being together? If we don't enjoy being together, we might need to do a self-check. What's going on with our hearts? We are family because God has made us one, and we should live like a family. And I think there's three actions that you and I can do to be family. First, every single one of us need to do these. Number one, we need to be intentional in building relationships. Closeness does not happen by accident. You can live under the same roof and not really feel like family, correct? You can live under the same roof and still feel distant from people. You have to be intentional about becoming close. And sometimes we get discouraged when we try and it feels like other people aren't reciprocating that. But we can only do what we can do. I, I need to be the one to text others. I need to be the one to invite them out to eat or to my house. I, I need to be the one to say, hey, my kids are playing ball this week and you want to come. I need to be the one to say, hey, what's going on with your life? How can I pray for you? We have to be intentional. The moment we say amen, intentional. How do I develop relationships? How do I find ways to spend time with people outside of here and make the most of my time here? We have to be intentional. Another thing we all need to be doing is we need to be mindful of our family. Um, growing up for me and more, you know, when I went to assemble with my brothers and sisters, it was dad, before my parents got divorced, it was my mom. But it was, it's my dad, my uncle, my brother, my sister-in-law, grandma, aunt. About seven rows forward, it's two other grandparents and an aunt. And so when I went, this is a family thing. And then I went to college and moved to Denver, and I walked in a church building, and this is just a me thing. And in Elk City, it was me, and I'm the only person essentially in my 20s. And then in Houston, it was just me, and here even Choctaw, it's me. And I never really understood what it was like to be by yourself, or what it's like to come to worship alone. Widows, orphans, we talked about them in our Bible class this morning, single those who have no spiritual support from their physical family. And I think we all need to be mindful. We all need to be like Katie Bella. She had no idea I was going to say that. I don't want to embarrass you. A week and a half, too late though, right? Uh, a week and a half ago, I walk out of class, and I, or a week ago, I sit on one of those rows because I'm looking around and people got their Bibles on pews and you know, they're with family, they're visiting, and I don't know where to sit. And so I sit down by myself. And Katie walks up and goes, what are you doing? Come sit with us. <laughs> and a week before that, when I was sitting in a pew on a Wednesday night by myself, Katie didn't ask. She just walked up and sat there. And that meant a lot to me because she thought of me. Hey, they need encouragement. He's, he doesn't have anyone to sit with. He's here by himself. And, and we need to be mindful that there are people within our number who really need more of a family at this moment than others, maybe. 
that there are widows and those who are hurting, that there are those who are single, that there are those who are going through a tough time, that don't have faith support behind them, we need to be mindful of them and say, I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to sit by you. I'm not going to ask. I'm going to invite you to sit with me. I'm going to have you over. I'm going to do these things because that's family. But lastly, we need to be forgiving to our family. We could preach for a year on forgiving one another. That needs a whole other series. But if, if we can't forgive one another, we're not a family based on Jesus. If we can't forgive each other, we've missed the whole point because we're only a family because of his forgiveness. This has happened, I think, to all of us, but sometimes we show up every week and there are people in here we've had little spats with, differences of opinion. We've said something. They gave me a dirty look. We might have even made that up in our own mind and we're unwilling to talk to them. And we say we're family and we're going to spend eternity together, but we don't even want to spend our temporary together. We need to be adults and say, hey, I said this thing one time. I'm sorry. I don't know if it offended you or not. I'm sorry. We need to be those people who say, I'm hurting. Hey, you offended me. You hurt me this time. And we need to be grown enough to say, I'm sorry, and to say, I forgive you. If we could sin against a holy God and put him on a cross, what excuse do you and I have to not uh, forgive one another? Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we're unwilling to forgive each other, good luck. Good luck. Let's be family that's intentional about our relationships, that's mindful of each other, and is willing to forgive one another. This morning, the moment we stop worshiping, let's do those. Let's be intentional, let's be mindful, and let's be forgiving. It might be this morning you have some brother or some sister you need to go talk to. That's what family does. It might be there's somebody who sits close to you that you need to get to meet. Maybe you need to have them over this week or go have dinner with them. There might be some people in this family you know that are hurting that could really use someone who thinks about them. But this morning it might also be that you're not even in the family. To be in the family, you have to obey the gospel call the way these individuals did. You do have to put your faith in Jesus to repent and be immersed in Him. And it's a wonderful blessing to be, to be right with Jesus, to be called back to Himself. And a little ice cream on top of your brownie is that you get a church family like this. It's almost like the Alamode. I love that. Remember the Alamode. That's, that's my motto. <laughs> if you need to become a Christian this morning, if you need to ask for prayers um, for your family, something going on in your life, if you need to go forgive somebody, whether you need to respond publicly or privately, think about that right now uh, while we stand and while we sing.